Is that a trick question? This man was a bona fide scrub. Bona fide scrub. This dude, I believe he's a bona fide superstar right now. Right. Oh, well, of course, it's all about winning, baby. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of the Star and Scrub NBA podcast. I'm joined by Lee here on a Sunday morning. It's about 9.30, a bit of a peculiar time for us to be recording this episode. We're going to go through the Southeast Division here on our, uh, our preview episodes. How are we, Lee? Excited to get into your Miami Heat. I'm very excited. I'm oddly really sore, actually. I've been trying to get back and do a bit of physical exercise lately, mate. A bit of gym work outside. Obviously, gyms are closed here in Victoria. Do you pull up way more sore after a game these days than you would have, like, a few years ago when back at school, maybe? Uh, What do you mean by game? What do you mean just by, like, a workout? Get workout game, mate. I know you played like AFL nine and stuff like that as yeah. well. So you pull up really like way more than you used to. Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm what twenty four years of age, but my back I think is about sixty seven. So yeah, that that's probably the biggest issue. I've got myself a massage gun and try and uh, keep on top of things, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm also about 110 kegs, so you know, moving around 110 kegs for a couple of hours or whatever else can uh, become quite difficult. But it is what it is. And uh, how are you recovering on a Sunday morning, though? I'm trying to. I'm only t- I'm 25 in a couple of months, mate. But I feel closer to 75 at this stage, <laughs> mate. But uh, we, that's why we're podcasters, not professional athletes. Uh, plenty to get into this uh, South East Division, and uh, that's uh, very excited to get into my Miami Heat, as you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just before we do start, uh, we are obviously the Star and Scrub NBA podcast. I wanted to get on to uh, just mention a couple of stars. I woke up this morning and watched the first of the uh, US Open finals, the women's, obviously, uh, between Emma Raducanu and Layla Fernandez. Fantastic match, uh, Raducanu. Too good in the end, but just crazy to see an 18 and a 19-year-old in a US Open women's final. Absolutely extraordinary scenes. And, of course, uh, Novak, my man, coming up, looking for the Calendar Grand Slam uh, tomorrow morning, our time here in Australia. And just a quick shout-out. I want to say Layla Fernandez's speech was probably the best losing speech I might have ever seen, and especially coming from a 19-year-old. And the way she mentioned uh, 9-11, of course, it's the 12th uh, here for us in Australia, but it's the uh, 11th over in America and uh, 20 years on from the 9-11. And uh, I guess as part of this podcast, we want to just send out our uh, thoughts and prayers, I guess, on this uh, pretty big day, I guess, for the people of America. And of course, we're talking about their league here in the NBA, but... uh, Otherwise, let's get into it. We're going to start, obviously, going in alphabetical order, as we do with the Atlanta Hawks. What a run they had last year, making it to the Eastern Conference Finals. We'll go through their ins and outs. So, uh, they picked up Sharif Cooper and Jalen Johnson in the draft. They also got Georgie Jeng, DeLon Wright, and the re-signings were probably the biggest thing for the Atlanta Hawks. Resigning Trey Young, John Collins, Clint Capella, Lou Williams, Solomon Hill, uh, and out for them go Chris Dunn, Tony Snell, and Bruno Fernando. What do you make of the Atlanta Hawks, Lee? Their over-under line sits at 46.5. Uh, I'm going to go over. I reckon they're going to be a really good regular season team. And, mate, you've hit it. What a t- they were a team of, like, two halves last year. Remember the Atlanta Hawks at the start of the season – completely different t- team and they it was a coaching coach change really and, yeah a coaching change and then they just look like an entire and then me saying Hawks in seven back in the room doing our playoff things and uh, <laughs> I look like a prophet of sorts um, I had a question of you uh, for you though obviously the abundance of young talent they've got um, so and I just want to say like do you see a glaring need at all they're pretty deep in most positions they're young they've got a great coach do you see a glaring need at this stage not really. I think they've got their. They've obviously got their point guard in place in uh, in Trey Young. They've obviously got their uh, front court basically sorted with John Collins and Clint Capella. They've got Jalen Johnson coming in there as well. I guess the wing position is the question mark, yeah. and whether some of those young guys can really turn into elite two way wings, uh, which is probably what they need. You look at. I know you always go on about how. The NBA is a big league now with the likes of Jokic and Embiid, but for me, it's still a wing league. Uh, the amount of you know finals MVPs that we've seen over the last few years, 
are always that six eight, six nine, you know, Yana six eleven type. Those big guys who can basically do everything on the floor uh, are so good offensively and are so good defensively as well. And right now, I don't think Atlanta have that player. Uh, now, whether one of their young guys, whether it be Kevin Herter, Cam Reddish, uh, DeAndre Hunter, uh, who who was missing uh, in the playoffs, whether it's one of those guys can stand up because they've got a bit of a, a hole there between the young guys and then your older experienced players who are on the the downward trajectory of their career, I guess, in the likes of, you know, Danilo Gallinari kind of thing. So that would be the hole for me. Uh, That doesn't mean they necessarily need to go out and find a wing. Uh, They've got the young talent there, so we'll just wait and see if that can develop. I agree with a lot of that. I think um, at a bare minimum, they'd be probably one of the most fun teams to watch. You imagine a bit of health. I mean, they were missing Hunter throughout the latter part of the playoffs. And Reddish as well didn't play a whole lot. Exactly right, and I think it's a fantastic. Cause I think, yeah, elite level, high end talent. I mean, I think Trey Young probably said top five point guard depth, a young depth as well, and they're bringing um, vets like Gordy Dang's not a household name or anything, but it's something like him who give you some valuable minutes uh, off the bench and good front office as well. I think they, they what's underrated is how well they draft. They yeah. like uh, try, uh, Luka Doncic and Trey Young the swap. At the, I guess in the first season probably was a bit risky to look at, but these <laughs> days, right. I don't know. That's a, it's not ridiculously horrible. Not one team won and what the other lost. So yeah, no, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd probably prefer Luca, obviously, but Trey's an all-star caliber of a great player in his own right. I'm not sure what he's doing at uh, the WWE uh, at MSG again, uh, just battling Rey Mysterio. Not sure what that was about, but uh, okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> is, is it safe to say that they've probably, for guys 24 and under, they have probably the best young talent in the league? I think so, because some teams are very young, maybe like look at Minnesota, but their management is so bad and their coaching is so bad. And I think why the Hawks are in the best position is they've got the young talent, but then they've got the development, the head office and the coach to go along with it. So I think it's pretty hard to put up another team against yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. Well, my question for you, I guess, is with this abundance of young talent, what's the logical next step for them? Or is it a case of maybe this season it's, two steps back to go one step forward kind of thing because making the Eastern Conference Finals again, that's going to be really hard to replicate. It is, and with the East as healthy as it is, it's improving to be difficult. Um, I think what's what I'm most excited about Atlanta is we, we get to, I guess, really find out what sort of Atlanta they are in a sense. So uh, put them up against healthy teams throughout the regular season. And I think it, you can almost give those young players valuable minutes to see who's going to be part of their future and who's not because you can easily put a trade package together. Cam Reddish, I don't think Hurd has been paid yet. Uh, yeah. I know Collins and stuff got paid, but I reckon you can put a package together for a star in the future. So I reckon be, this is going to be a great season for their front office to know, mate, listen, this is who's going to be part of our future and who's not. And um, if you don't perform, I think it's for <laughs> you just know that you're going to be part of a trade package for a, for a better player. So yeah. um, I think, yeah, put it, giving those um, players significant minutes, especially during the regular season, really know who's a part of the future and going from there. How would well, if you're the front office? What what are you, what are you looking at? You I, I like I like that idea. If you know, if a uh, you look at the guys available on the market now, you know Ben Simmons. He doesn't really work when you've got Collins, and I know Simmons yeah. technically you know plays the point guard kind of thing, but Trey Young's there, and then I think wherever Simmons goes, he has to be a power forward kind of even you know, a small ball center in some situations, and you're not going to do that with Collins and Capella there. So Simmons isn't a fit. Even if someone like Damian Lillard became available, you don't necessarily need him next to Trey Young. Same with Bradley Beal. But if one of those two-way wings did become available, then they would be a team, I think, in the market uh, for one of those types. Anyway, let's get on to where do you have them sitting in the Eastern Conference? As I said, the over-under line is 46.5. Are they going over or under that? Uh, and where do you have them uh, sitting? I had them finishing fifth um, in the East, but that's going to probably be uh, maybe slightly over. I think they're yeah. going to be a great regular season team. I think fully healthy. Do you? Where do you have them sitting? Yeah, finishing? so we. I have them sixth. Uh, I have yeah. them under, maybe, but I'm not. I, uh, I'm not betting on it. So yeah, yeah, start a on no a boring note, this, but <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to bet on that. That's a. There'll be somewhere between forty. Four and forty-eight wins, maybe. 
Yeah, I think with a fully healthy A star, they might be there, but that'll be fun to watch full stop. And I, I can't wait for him when he goes to MSG again. The fans, the Knicks, the Knicks fans, even <laughs> Trey Young, have the best relationship, I reckon. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. Anyway, uh, fifth and sixth for us for the Atlanta Hawks. But up next, uh, Lee can't wait because we're not talking about the Miami Heat just yet, but we will be talking about one of his favourite players outside of the Heat, I think. That's LaMelo Ball. He can't stop talking about him. That's up next. All righty, we're on to the Charlotte Hornets. Made some big moves in the offseason, bringing in uh, James Booknight and Kai Jones through the draft, uh, bringing in uh, Kelly Oubre from Golden State, Mason Plumley and Ish Smith. They re-signed Terry Rogier and out go Devontae Graham, Bismack Biombo, Malik Monk to the Lakers. Uh, slightly disappointed in that from a Hornets point of view. Cody Zeller and Caleb Martin. Their over under line is 37 and a half. Where do you see the Hornets at going into this season? Um, I think uh, I don't have them making playoffs. I've seen a lot of people very confident in them making playoffs, but mate, I have them finishing 12th. And under that thirty-seven point five, I don't, I don't, I think it's going to be a lot of heat applied to them. What? what hang on, where, where's I, your? Have you fallen for the hype? I'm where surprised do you because you you're all over the Lamelo bandwagon. You said I think it was at last podcast or maybe the podcast before that he was going to be an all star this season. Uh, obviously, that he's the face of that franchise moving forward, but you don't think that they're good enough to make the playoffs just yet. Uh, but to be fair. I do agree with you. I have them 11th. Uh, I think okay. there's some improvement there, but I look, you know, I was putting my Eastern Conference rankings together, and a lot of these teams have improved. And Charlotte, I oh, would say, have improved their roster, but not substantially so to uh, to become a genuine playoff contender, I don't think. Uh, they might be around the mark, but, yeah, I'm on that under 37.5 as well. Again, I'm probably not betting on it. Uh, it's probably a bit risky to bet on these kind of young, talented teams who do have some upside, which Charlotte do. Uh, and I think mm. when we you know, were doing our previews last year, we kind of started to get excited about the direction this team was going. And uh, they've certainly got a direction now uh, and a plan in place to become... Firstly, a playoff contender, and then hopefully, who knows, a few years down the track, Lamelo turns into one of the best players in the NBA. Uh, maybe they're a championship contender. But if you're a Hornets fan, so you've got them 12th, would you be disappointed with that, or are you just happy to see another season of development? I'm very happy to see a season of development because Charlotte are uh, notorious. Michael Jordan, for all the greatness he was as a player, he's a horrific manager. The contract is handed out, the signings he's made. So all I'd want is just player development. You've got to, as I said, we drafted very well. As you know, I love Kai Jones and I'm, I'm still going to hold. I'm going <laughs> to hang up for hope. He's going <laughs> to... <laughs> yeah, he loves... Um, no, I'm going to hang out for hope there. Um, but I think it's going to be... Tough as the first thing you mentioned was the um, how each team has improved in the East, and sure the Hawk, the uh, Hornets have improved, but not as not enough in terms of high end talent. And next year, so if you're a team and you're playing the Charlotte Hornets, what's your defensive strategy surrounded upon? Stopping Lamelo yeah. Ball as much as yeah. possible. You do not want him because he's such a culture changer. He makes he made Bismarck Biombo look half decent last year. Miles Bridges, I'd completely forgotten about him. He looked decent because of Lamelo Ball. So next year, Lamelo Ball, he's only twenty, but an entire team's defensive strategy will be around getting the ball out of his hand and stopping as much as possible. Yeah. And that's a lot to ask a twenty-year-old kid. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very high on him individually, but in, that's too much asking him to improve an entire franchise. So if I just want to see health, first of all, because when Gordon Haywood's there, yeah. he, do you know, I remember one part, when the one little stretch, he was healthy. They were like fourth or fifth seed. So I want to see health from mm. him, um, but just James Booknight, I don't want to see his confidence getting up. Kai Jones, obviously, developing. Is, I, really want, I really want him to develop. Um, and there, so you it doesn't sound, sound like you're in the same boat, though. You wouldn't be... Like shock if they you know what? I was literally just going through their lineup and I was thinking, oh, so, you know, Lamelo, Rogier, Kelly Oubre, PJ Washington, and like Mason Plumley or, or whoever. And then I just completely forgot about Gordon Haywood. <laughs> I don't know why. I just <laughs> forgot he was on the team and he's on $30 million. Uh, he was actually quite good last season when he was healthy. Uh, yeah, he was, he was quite good. So, 
I don't know. Maybe the, the team on roster, I have an issue with them defensively. They just don't have a defensive stopper there, I don't think. You look at that backcourt of Lamelo and Rogier, they're not guarding anyone. Ubre looks like he can guard people because he's willing to pick up guys uh, full court and kind of play high-intensity defense. But whether he's actually a good defender or not, I'm not so sure. Uh, that front court, they just haven't... That's That's their one hole, is that... I'm not sure where PJ Washington or, or what PJ Washington becomes as an NBA player. Uh, they obviously had Cody Zeller and basically replaced him with Mason Plumley. Maybe a slight upgrade there, but they would they would be really hoping that uh, Kai Jones can come on and can eventually be a uh, a starter for them in the next few years as a uh, a really big threat as a pick and roll partner with Lamelo because that could be quite exciting and that's the other thing I think for Charlotte and and why I think you're happy to see another season of development is because even if this team doesn't make the playoffs I think they're still going to be a really exciting team I just think any team with Lamelo ball in it is really exciting and I'm happy to turn on league pass and watch this team play and there's a lot of teams that are down the bottom of each conference where you, you don't say that. You're just like, no, I don't want to watch that team play. There's, there's no interest in them. There is genuine interest in the Charlotte Hornets, so I think fans should be happy about where where the direction of this team is going. That's, I think, all you need. I think the commentators make them most famous, but uh, Lamelo Ball, I, I, I need to talk about it. <laughs> Again? <laughs> Again. For, 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 yeah, once a day, I reckon. To see him develop... Every single game that he played, I don't know why their coach held out for starting him so long, to see how much better he made every player around him. He's, he's almost like a culture changer. I'm, I don't know if I'm being dramatic with that, but I actually felt like the Charlotte Hornets loved playing with him and it, so many people got better from him. So, I need to know, mate, what is your How far can Lamelo Ball get in his career? How What is his ceiling to you with the six foot six playmaking Active defense. He was playing as sort of towards. How far do you see him going? Yeah, I think he's got six foot six coverage. I think he's close to six eight, probably than six six. Was he about six seven? Yeah, Somewhere around really... that mark. It's always different whether you got shoes on or off, and who knows what uh, happens sometimes <laughs> with the uh, with the height of NBA players. Sometimes they seem to change a couple of inches each season. But uh, yeah, in answer to your question, I don't know. Is is saying like MVP caliber player a stretch? I don't know. That's what I'm yeah, going to that's, yeah? that's what I'm okay. going to Yeah. I, I mean, MVP. what do we have? An over-under line of 0.5 MVPs for Lamelo Ball in his career? <laughs> what are you taking? You're taking the overs? Are you taking that he's going to win an MVP <laughs> in his career? I don't know. It's a tough one. Yeah, I think he'd be in the conversation. I think at some point he'll have a top three MVP year. But as we know with MVP, it all, it all comes down to, obviously, uh, how good you are as an individual player, but how you can also lead your team. Uh, and at some point throughout his career, he's going to have to lead the Charlotte Hornets to a top four or five finish in the Eastern Conference. I've got no doubt he'll do that, and therefore he's probably going to, uh, at some point, be in the conversation, I guess. I've, I've, already, I've got him as a future MVP, mate. But just based on how much he improved, I think he almost answered... Every, I thought there were questions around his shooting and his uh, shot selection because yeah. I saw some... Cr- I remember when he was shooting from half court in high school and stuff, but he was actually way more efficient than I thought. Three-point shooting was going in, and even he's an active defender. He's not like a lockdown guy, but he'll get deflections. He'll get like weak side blocks and stuff. So I think, mate, he, in terms of potential and what he's got to have... So he's probably is close to 6'8", yeah. I think. He's taller than Lonzo. Like he's got Lonzo covered. He's just, just got to beef up a bit, so, really, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, he, that's easily going to happen. So I think uh, Lavar Ball uh, was right. Is, is, is the answer to this question? Lavar <laughs> Ball. Like and we'll uh, we'll wait and see if uh, Leangelo can get a spot on that roster, maybe as a two way or, or something like that. But uh, up next, we have your Miami Heat. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm looking forward to getting into this or not. Up next, my Miami Heat, my beloved Heat was a uh, big off-season. A lot uh, to, had to be done after the season we just had. Probably the biggest in was Kyle Lowry. I think uh, Jimmy Butler's best friend, very excited for him. Mark Heath Morris, we took, and PJ Tucker from the defending championships, which I was quite surprised about. Resign Butler to a big deal. Udonis Haslam mm. got his yearly $2.6 million that he'll get for the next 10 years. I what think. is going on with uh, that? <laughs> 
I, I think he's a great. I think he's got a front office things as well. But I don't know that's just going to happen for the next ten years or whatever. Dwayne Dedman, Oladipo, which I'm stoked we got him on vet- yeah. veteran in, and Duncan Robinson, which I know you have some things today. Max Drews, Gabe Vincent, Omar Yutzman, who's the seven footer that we mm. found. Uh, we lost Precious to Toronto. Trevor Reza to the Lakers. Uh, Tragic Iguodala and Kendrick Nunn. Our line is forty eight point five. Uh, first of all, I want to know where you've got mum heat finishing. I want to know where you... Straight off the bat. Uh, I think you'll be reasonably Noah's. reasonably happy with my uh, predictions here. Third, and and over 48 and a half, and it's probably, of, it's probably the most confident of these five over-unders is uh, the heat over 48 and a half. I just think there's enough, there's enough talent and enough depth there. I'm not sure if I see them transitioning into a genuine uh, championship contender, but for me, they are. They will be a very good regular season team, or they should be a very good re- regular season team. Uh, yeah, so I've got them third. What about yourself? This is weird. I've got them fourth. <laughs> I mean, just want a run under. <laughs> <laughs> what's going, what's going on start, here? I didn't know how to start off, but um, as you know, like Miami Heat, we were in the NBA Finals, and then the start to the next season was horrific i need to know for us next season to coming up to this season you said we're gonna be a great regular season team who's going to be the biggest x factor on the miami heat in terms of us being just a great regular season team to even being possibly pushing some contenders well there's two there's two players for me and Mm -hmm. when you're looking at yeah, any team, I think you and, and see where their growth and development lies. I think you've got to look at the younger players because the older guys, you kind of know what you're going to get. You know, you know what you're going to get from Jimmy Butler. Hopefully, he has a, a full year healthy. You know what you're going to get from yeah. Kyle Lowry coming in. So you understand what those guys are going to bring you, uh, but there's no real improvement, I don't think, in Kyle Lowry at 35 years of age. There's no improvement in Jimmy yeah. Butler, even though he's just signed a, a five-year max extension. So really, I think it comes down to the first one, Bam Adebayo. Can he make a jump and become a, who knows, maybe a top three center in the league? I, I think we look at Jokic and we look at Embiid, and maybe there's a, a drop off after that, and, and and kind of a debate on who that uh, the third best center in the league is. And I think Bam Adebayo could elevate himself into that conversation if he's not there already. So uh, hopefully the experience that he had with Team USA uh, will hold him in good stead and, and see some development from him and, and a full year of health this season. And the other one, which I think is almost just as crucial, is Tyler Hero. When Okay. When we saw the Heat make the NBA Finals in Tyler Hero's rookie season, it looked like he was going to turn into and develop into an all-star caliber Larry player. Bird. Yeah, and be an, an absolute gun. But his second season, he regressed significantly. So for me, I'm looking forward to this season. Is Tyler Hero going to revert back to what we saw in his rookie season uh, and grow on that? Or is what we saw from him last season... The the the, uh, the way things are going to go moving forward. So for me, Tyler Hero is actually I know he's he's going to be a bench player, but mm. uh, how much he can develop going forward, I think is going to be really crucial. Uh, how did you see where kind of the uh, things lie, I guess, for the Heat and where the developments uh, and improvement might come from? Well, mate, I think you've nailed everything. I know what I'm going to get from Kyle Larry. I'll get 18 points, 8 assists, 40% from 3, like good, tough leadership. Butler, as we know, big shot maker, defend everyone. But I think, bam, for us to be to be truly like, oh, dare I say, title contenders, I think he needs to make a massive jump, a massive jump offensively. So every elite big, those elite bigs you just mentioned, have an element of like outside shot. And I was reading his stats. He shot two two point seven like uh, jump shots, like outside the mid-range area, like last year, and he only shot 42% on those jump shots. So it's, and he doesn't shoot threes. He just simply doesn't shoot any threes. So I think that needs to be a big element that needs to add into his game because he, as I'm going to keep reiterating, it's a big league and he's going to have to defend some big names. So for him to, um, for us to be that sort of title contender, I think he needs to not only be almost like need defensive player of the year, but make a significant jump with his um, spreading the floor. 
Uh, and I think because he's got so many defensive uh, aspects to his game, he's got. I've seen some playmaking as well. But yeah, for us to really make that jump, he's a lot's going to be put on his young shoulders. Um, but I'm glad that we've got Kyle Larry, Jimmy Butler. I think are fantastic leaders for any franchise, and I think that's going to be great. Udonis has him. I was just laughing about him getting his yearly thing, but I think he's a great leader for the Miami Heat. So I think he's in a great environment for him. He's got his big payday, and um, I think that's it. But yeah, Tyler Hero. I think that's that's what my fear was um, in terms of Atlanta. Hawks, like a lot of people, like because I think he just got more defensive attention next year. And yeah. why I'm worried about like Lamelo Ball making playoffs or whatever is just there's a lot more defensive attention going to be placed onto him. But I think we're going to be tough. We're going to be tough. To, I reckon we'll push. I don't. Yeah. I don't reckon you want to go up against Miami Heat early in the playoffs if you're one of those contenders. I reckon we'll beat up some teams. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I don't really. I'm not, I'm not ready to say we're title contenders yet. I think I need to see some big, big jumps. Yeah. I think from a, from a couple of people. But uh, yeah, certainly won't, won't want to go up against this. Yeah. Uh, early on. Yeah. I think uh, part of, for me, part of looking at whether you guys are actually, you know, can become title contenders is the fact you look at all those those teams in title contention or around the mark, they all have basically a top five player in the NBA, whether it's the Lakers with LeBron, whether it's the Nets with KD, whether it's the Bucks with Giannis, those top teams, they all have a top five player in the NBA. I look at this Heat roster and it's very talented and it's very deep, uh, but I don't see a player there who is a top 10 player in the NBA and maybe not even, you know, I don't know where we'd rank Jimmy Butler in terms of players in the NBA, but he might not even be top 15. So if you don't have a top 15 player on your roster, I just don't, there's a limit. There's a, there's a ceiling of how far you can go come playoff time. Mm. And with that talent, with that depth, I think they can be a very good regular season team. That's why I have them third. That's why I have them over 48 and a half. But with their current roster construction, I can't put them in title contention because they just don't have that top 10 player. Unless we think Butler can, you know, turn back into kind of what he was in the bubble, uh, which was, you know, the form of a top 10 player. But for me, he's not a top 10 player. He's barely maybe a top 15 player. Uh, and not only that, but it's also looking at guys who we know this team is going to be so good defensively. But how how many guys on this roster can give you thirty a night? And I just don't mm. think there's too many players on this roster that are going to give are going to average thirty in a playoff series, which is what you need. We saw with Giannis in the finals. We saw with you know KD, even though they went down to the Bucks. You know you need a guy that can average your thirty points across a series. I just don't think the Heat have that. Maybe Butler can get you twenty five potentially, but who's going to do that for you? So for me, uh, that was my my question to you about: Are you concerned about the fact that there's no top ten, maybe no top fifteen player on the roster? And if you are, where does that player come from? Is it Bam all of a sudden elevating his game to an extreme level, and all of a sudden he's like a top? 10 top 15 player in the league or do you have to continue to make moves to your roster I think that's where my biggest concern like uh, hesitancy comes from putting us in title contention because yeah we don't have that just almost like generational talent because because I've watched every dribble of those NBA finals as you know and there were some sh- like plays in there like Butler's played perfect defense Bam has done everything against LeBron but just their greatness just overtook it yeah. and uh, we don't I don't know if I have that person that I know Great, almost the greatness is going to overwhelm anyone. Uh, so yeah, I think that is probably where my biggest concern is. But I, I kind of like the position we're in. Obviously, we've got some sort of almost pressure to perform like as we did uh, a couple of years ago. But we also don't have the time to sort of throw away. I mean, Butler's older, Kyle Lowry's older. We we kind of have to um, try as hard as we can. We don't we don't really have that time. So I'm kind of I kind of kind of like the position we're in. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to put our squad up against anyone, honestly, on, at least on paper. I mean, healthy on paper. I mean, if Oladipo can get close to that 2018, 2019 Oladipo again, you put Kyle Lowry next yeah. to him in the backcourt, Butler. Oh, He's someone we two. didn't mention as uh, a player who is going to be a massive difference maker to this team. If he can get fit and healthy, then all of a sudden, uh, as I keep speaking about, that talent and depth, uh, as you said, with him and Lowry, with Butler, with Bam, PJ Tucker coming in, Duncan Robinson, uh, Tyler Hero we speak about. I mean, that's seven genuine NBA players right there who could potentially start for a lot of teams. So, uh, yeah, a very deep roster, and for that reason, I think they're going to be great throughout the regular season. Uh, and I've got them third, and I like the over 48.5. You had them fourth. Was that over 48.5 for you? 
Yeah, I had, I had Viva as well. Yeah, I can create regular season. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Anyway, next up, uh, we go from a semi-exciting team in the Heat to a young, developing, maybe kind of boring team uh, in the Magic, but stay tuned. Uh, yeah, massive drop-off in teams now with the Orlando Magic, uh, probably the, one of the worst franchises in the NBA. They're in uh, Robin Lopez and then through the draft. <laughs> Oh, jeepers. <laughs> Try and get then, through this with a straight line. Uh, uh, then through the draft, Jalen Suggs came in of France, Wagner, and then the outs were Dwayne Bacon, James Ennis, and Otto Porter to your uh, Golden State Warriors. They re-signed Mo Wagner, uh, and I have them as the probably the worst, probably close to one of the worst teams in the NBA. I've got them finishing 15th in their conference. Yeah. Uh, even their line of 21.5, I've got under that. Uh, Do you? Am I being dramatic? No, you're not. I have them, I have them last <laughs> in the East. Uh, that's. I don't think that's... And I don't think that's necessarily like being too harsh because, you know what? I actually like what they're doing. I actually don't mind it. So I also have under 21 and a half. I'm not going to bet on that because I hate like... One, I don't... You know, I spoke about it on, the, on our first preview podcast last week. I don't want to bet on crap teams kind of thing uh, and, and therefore have to watch their games. But that line of twenty one and a half, it's too low. I know they're probably not going to win twenty one games. They're probably going to go under. But that's just too low. It's too low. Maybe you know if a, if a team goes on a run for two weeks, then that line's just dead in the water kind of oh, thing. Yeah. But in saying that, I don't think the Magic are going to go are going to go on a run. You know, over a two week period where they go like six or seven and zero kind of thing. My question to you is. If you're a Magic fan, what's the one thing you want to see this season? I, I just want to uh, say before you answer that, I, I want to uh, forward on with that comment that I, I like where they're going is because we spoke about in our preview podcast before last season where this was a, a team that was stuck in the middle around the 7 to 10 range, wasn't sure what they were doing. They had uh, Vucevic, Fournier and Gordon. And then at the trade deadline, they said stuff it. And they got rid of those three players didn't get that necessarily a whole lot back in return, but I don't think that necessarily matters. It was more about resetting and actually just tanking almost and just being like, hey, you know what? We're going to be shit for the next few years and we're going to embrace that. And it's almost like the 76ers. I like, trust the process. Now, it hasn't worked out for the 76ers necessarily as of yet, but if you're the Magic, you've got Jalen Suggs in and I see no harm in why you can't just suck this season and try and get the number one pick. Like, that's... As a fan, you've got a there's, there's a way of rebuilding, and where they were at between that seven and ten range was not doing anything really. So at least they've got some kind of process going on here. But uh, back to my initial question: What is the one thing you want to see this season from a Magic point of view? That's a great point you put. That mid middle of the pack thing, where you're not getting you're not contending, but you're not getting the top picks, can actually be almost worse than some uh, being quite low. So I think I want to see them to almost stop cheating the process as you just mentioned so i remember their 2016 off season they randomly just signed like bismack biombo jeff green and sergi bucker just out of nowhere they just signed up and stuff and had all these young talent there and obviously that screws up your cap space your young players don't get any minutes you're already horrible like in terms of developing talent i can see Mm. maybe you're trying to get vets in there for these big contracts they'll sign them to and when you look at their roster suggs 20 the the Wagner brothers, like 24 and 22. Mo Bumba, I'm not sure if you remember him. The fifth oh, pick, I don't, I, I'm not holding out too much hope for Mo Bumba, to be honest. I'm going to blame Orlando for the, the reason why he sucks, because I think he's going to be a great player. Gary Harris, I go Hampton. They're all, none of them are over like 23 years old. So your entire focus should be purely player development and stop just screwing up their development by randomly signing these players that just kind of take up all your cap space in there. So that's yeah. what I want to see. Stop ruining their, and like even just pulling the trigger on, like, so that mid-season trade in there as well, you just ran, you just, that, that didn't see any plan behind that. Oh, actually, maybe I guess was to see them um, get a higher pick. So if I was to pick one thing that I want to see is, uh, yeah, stop stop trying to almost cheat the process and trying to fast track it. What uh, what would give you any hope, if anything, if you're a Well, fan? I think they've been just so terribly, yeah, <laughs> at, or so terrible, sorry, at, dra- at uh, not drafting players as such, but developing them once they've yeah. been drafted. We think of uh, the Mo Bumbers uh, and those types. And for me, that's what I want to see is Jalen Suggs coming in. And from all reports, this is a guarantee good player that you've got here. And... 
If they stuff Jalen Suggs up, I don't know what hope this franchise has, in all honesty. If they stuff him up, I'm not sure what's going on because he does seem like a, a sure thing prospect. But I guess Jalen Suggs taken five in the draft. Could you see him as your... Could, could you see a great rookie year from him where all of a sudden this guy projects to be your franchise cornerstone of the future and a player you can build around, especially if you know you do get another top three pick and then you bring in someone next to him. So for me, Jalen Suggs is probably the one player that even if every other player on the team is terrible next season, if he's good, then that's mm. a positive. If he's yep. you know close to rookie of the year, in fact, I think he's a probably a, not a bad shout a smoke, for, for rookie of the year. I have to look that up seriously. seriously yeah, because he's going to get so hey. much opportunity in that franchise. Uh, so he's the one player I think that beyond anyone else you're looking at pretty closely. The other thing for me is health. They've had just issues with injuries as well. I mean, this team when you had Vucevic, Fournier, Gordon. And uh, Fultz was actually playing okay before he did his ACL early ACL, last season. Yeah. And the mm. other player for me, the big one, is Jonathan Isaac. He's kind of oh. forgotten about a bit. He's got, he's the one guy who I think has got a, elite potential, at least on the defensive end. I think I look at Jonathan Isaac. I think he can be a defensive player of the year candidate. I think he's that good defensively. He's one of the yeah, one of the best wing defenders in the league. So he's mm. had a horrific injury uh, history. He's coming off obviously a major injury. He hasn't played since the bubble where he did his ACL. So we're talking eighteen months or so. Yeah. I just would, as a, from a Magic perspective, as a fan, I would just want to see Jonathan Isaac back on the court and getting through a full season healthy. Markel Fultz. Look, I don't know what's going on there. I don't oh. really know what's going on with their guard rotation because obviously they've brought in Jalen Suggs, but they've still got Markel Fultz. They've still got uh, RJ Hampton. Obviously, they brought in in the trade uh, with Aaron Gordon. And they've got Cole Anthony as well. So they've kind of got four guards there that you kind of would probably be wanting to give minutes to all of them kind of thing. So oh. I'm not sure what's going on with their guard rotation. But, yeah, for me, it's probably Jalen Suggs, uh, number one, and then it's also the health of Jonathan Isaac. I actually think, did Jonathan Isaac, did he do back-to-back ACLs? I think, uh, or something? No, I don't think so. I think he had some injury two. issues before that ACL. No, he's just he's just missed 18 months with an ACL, which sounds, which sounds extraordinary, really, because you kind of think of an ACL and you think, well, 12 months is the, the roundabout, but most yeah. players probably come back before that. He's going to have, yeah, 18 months, basically, uh, from, from playing after that ACL. So... Uh, looking forward to seeing what he can come back and do uh, from a Magic perspective. Just on paper, in terms of talent, like Michael Fultz was a number one pick. You'd have to go back to his college highlights to look at how good he was. But he was a combo guard, long, could score from everywhere. And I'm, I think I really, really love Jalen Suggs as a pick. From all accounts, leadership, tough, two-way type of player. So, yeah, maybe... Mate, yeah. But, oh yeah, mate, I still haven't finished it last, though. <laughs> still... I'm finishing last as well. Just on that Mark L. Fultz point, before, do you know before he did his ACL, it was like the fifth game of the season. They were 5-0 and leading the NBA after like the first five games of last season, and Mark L. Fultz was putting up like 20 points a game. I, I don't think people re- remember that. <laughs> Just for like the first five games of last season, Mark L. Fultz came out and was averaging like 20, and they were like 5-0 and and hadn't lost and were like top of the NBA. It was quite extraordinary. That's but, why we don't bet on these bad teams. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, uh, next up, we'll get off the Orlando Magic and we'll get into the very interesting Washington Wizards. All right, I genuinely believe the Washington Wizards are one of the most interesting teams in the league because they make that big trade, Russell Westbrook to the Lakers, and bring in those Lakers players. But they also made some other moves uh, across free agency and whatnot that have just made them a really interesting team, I guess. So they're in KCP, Kuzma, and Montrezl Harrell, obviously, in that Westbrook trade. They then sign uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, Aaron Holiday. They draft Corey Kispert. Out goes Isaac Bonga, Alex Land, Robin Lopez, Ish Smith, and, uh, and Russ, as we speak of. Am I, like, wrong in just flat out saying that this team is just better, like, now than it was at the end of last season? And we've got to remember, they made the playoffs last season, so they weren't horrendous whatsoever. And I, I actually think they're better. Is is that wrong of me to say? That's oh, certainly better, but uh, I'm very curious where you have them finishing and with, what do you think about their line? This so is, their line's, their line's at 34 and a half. 
I like the line. I'm I'm probably it's probably my second most confident. I'm on that over thirty four and a half, and I've got the mates. I just think they're talented and deep enough, especially across the regular season. We know what happens with in, we know what happens with injuries. We know what happens now with COVID and players sitting out, you know, games and stuff. They've got like 10, 11 genuine NBA players. And in some ways, yeah. that's a bit of a difficulty because there's a lot of guys that you kind of got to give minutes to. But in saying that, mm-hmm. they're one of the teams that outside of, you know, Beal, they can actually cover kind of their injuries and, and cover maybe some COVID losses and, and stuff like that, unlike other teams who you know, might only bat, you know, kind of eight or nine deep kind of thing. So I just think they're a really deep team. I like the overs. Uh, and I have them finishing eighth. Now, that's basically where they were at last season. Uh, yes, I think they're better, but I also think the East in general is a lot better. So I had them eighth, making making the playoffs again. Uh, it's probably, again, the situation like we just talked around about where the Magic were last season or uh, at the start of last season in that kind of middling uh, section of teams where you're not really sure what they're doing. But with all those new players, they're going to be interesting uh, at least. Okay, I've got them tenth. Okay, explain. <laughs> and I'm not. And, and I, it's for, mainly because the East just got so much stronger. Yeah. But I think if I think if you're a shooting guard or power forward this year, you're gonna be. I'm gonna trash you these podcasts. I don't think you can build around Bradley Bill <laughs> in terms of winning basketball. Because that was my first question to you, actually, in terms of the Washington Wizards. Bradley Beal, such a nice game to watch. Do you think you can build around him? Like, he can be the best player on a team. Uh, he can be the best player on a team, but on a championship team. I think he can be the best player on a playoff team. I'm happy with that. A playoff team that's probably, like, fifth to eighth. Uh, he's not going to be the best player on a top four team, I don't think. He's probably a second guy. That's why I think that if he does leave in France, he's probably going to the Celtics and he's probably pairing up with Tatum as that the second player next to Tatum. I'd probably like that trio of Tatum, Brown, and uh, and Beal. But let's not uh, get too down for Wizards fans that might be listening to this because there's a chance that this team might be reasonable and might do enough to uh, allow uh, Bradley Beal to, to stay at this franchise or, or at least make him want to stay at this franchise. And... Uh, Bo reports he loves Washington. You know, there'd be plenty of reason for him That's to already fair. request a trade and one-up out of there, but he hasn't done that as as of yet, and he seems like a pretty loyal guy. Uh, so, yeah, in answer to your question, I don't think he's the best player on a championship team, but I think he can be the best player on a playoff team. Uh, for me, as I just spoke about before, they're in this middling section. I think they're a team where if they start the season as a 7th or 8th seed, do you think they should go all in on a star should they become available or look to reset, maybe try and get something for Beal while he's under contract, maybe get rid of these Lakers guys they've brought in in uh, KCP, Kuzma, Montres, Harrell kind of thing. Do they try and reset or... Because they've got... Yes, they've brought in the experienced guys, but they've actually got some young talent there in Rui Hachimura, Denny Avdia, Daniel Gafford was pretty good as a big guy. Thomas Bryant's coming off a, a major injury. They've just drafted Corey Kispert. So, yes, they've brought in this ex- these experienced talent, but they've also got some young talent there as well. And for me, it's where where do they go? If they're in this middling period, like where do they do what the Magic did and just trade out all kind of their experienced guys and go real super young? Or do they think that if they package up some of their young talent and go for a star that they can all of a sudden jump into a top four seat? I think uh, you, you've you got so many assets that you can use and Bradley Beal's under contract. So if, I, if it was the seventh and eighth seat, as you're saying, I would honestly package it up because how much longer can you accept like mediocrity as a franchise? You were talking about last week, like it's a business at the end of the day. Yeah. Like you want to put bums in seats, you want to thrive as a franchise. And I look at Bradley Beal as, I guess, the focal point. So, And I looked at his stats. Every year he's improved. I mean, the last two years, he's averaged 30 plus. Yeah. And he goes on these crazy runs uh, just as an individual player. But just look, every time I see Bradley Beal, 38 points, which Washington Wizards lost to the Orlando Magic. And I really wonder, like, how much longer you, can you accept this? And why not get a trade package for all of this and then just try and get a better player in? Because if he's doing all of this, if he's getting better and you're still losing, 
the common sense and the logic would just show you have to try a different route. So that's why I, I just don't think Bradley Beal, he doesn't have the like playmaking ability or like the defensive game to like really like, because say James Harden's a shooting guard, but he's got this elite he's a level point guard, really. That can, yeah. He's he's just a freakish talent. So I think Bradley, how much longer? Because if he has another season averaging thirty one points, yeah, that's great. But then you've nine seed and you don't make the playoffs again. Yeah. Oh, this uh, you love his loyalty; it's amazing. But oh, mate, it's a business at the end of the day, and you want to start winning. Yeah. So yeah, mate. I do. You, how much of that do you agree? I with think I'm well? actually convincing myself that they should almost go all in, and it's purely just to keep mm-hmm. Bill, really. And I actually okay. think, like. If you, I don't know, who's going to become available? I think the good thing about them is that got all these guys that are good players, but they're not great players where you can't move them and, you know, they're kind of locked into a position. So if you look at Beal, basically outside of him, you can go and get whoever you want and it's going to be an upgrade. You can go get a wing and it's going to be an upgrade to what you've already got. You can go get a backcourt, backcourt partner next to Bradley Beal and it's going to be better than Spencer Dinwiddie. Now, I think Spencer Dinwiddie might be their second best player now, so you might not want to necessarily get rid of him. But if it's a wing type, if it's a big, I think there's kind of anyone that becomes available would fit on the Washington Wizards, and I think that's pretty exciting. I mean, you look at Ben Simmons right now. Uh, you know, what's the asking price for Ben Simmons? I think Ben Simmons would fit with the Washington Wizards next to Bradley Beal as another as a, another playmaker, as as a a really solid top three defensive player in the NBA, which the Wizards have been atrocious defensively in recent years. Bradley Beal himself has come out and just given different adjectives and descriptions for what their defense has been over the past couple of seasons. It has been horrific. They're giving up 150 points some games, like absolutely trash. I think Ben Simmons would be a great fit with Washington and maybe like a sneaky one where it's just like you think of the teams that are, I guess, rumoured to be involved in a potential Ben Simmons trade. Like, the Wizards have the assets. And from a Philly point of view as well, maybe you think that even with Ben Simmons coming in, you know, the the Wizards might still not be great, and therefore their picks are still going to be, you know, maybe lottery uh, kind of thing. So, I don't know. They've... That's a tough one because, yeah, they've, they've got assets there to go and make a big move, and if I were them, I'd do it. Now... Maybe it's not Simmons. Maybe you wait on someone who is a higher caliber than that. Uh, maybe it's a Dame. I don't know. I'd probably prefer a wing or a big. But they've got assets there. I I, I kind of like the idea of just going all in. And if it's if all in means being a top four seed and making the second round, then that's that's, that's not this. too bad. That's <laughs> not too bad. That'll convince Bradley Beal to stay. And then who knows? Bradley Beal's still got five, six years left in his prime kind of thing. You can still build upon that. You can build on a second round. You know, who knows where you can get to kind of thing. So I actually, yeah, I've convinced myself in the last 10 minutes, convinced I've convinced myself they need to make a move. They, I, I seriously think they do. And I think they've got the capacity to, which is the main thing. I think a team, well, you and I just said it, mate, that seventh, eight, seven to ten range, if you're a franchise, can probably be one of the worst things to be in. You're not, like, getting high picks like the Orlando Magic card, but obviously you're not getting a championship. It's this mediocrity that's... And you get, like, draft picks like the 16th pick or whatever. So, yeah, I think I think you need to, mate. You can't have another season like this. You can't. Yeah. Well, I think, you, I you've got them, to do I'll tell you what right now. You've got them 10th. If they finish 10th, I think Bradley Beal's up and out of there. I'm I'm saying that. Yeah, Done. I think That's so. Nice you draw. can't yeah. you can't finish tenth. I think you've got to make the playoffs. You just have to make the playoffs to keep Bradley Beal. Best way to do that, that is, be, yeah. depending on what player it is. I wouldn't be giving up all my young players for Ben Simmons, but who knows who might become available, who might become disgruntled at their current team as the season progresses. Uh, were you over or under thirty four and a half though? Because like around tenth is probably unders. You saying? Yeah, slightly under, so I yeah. reckon, is uh, that. What, your, yeah. no, were you a no bet for this uh, one? I probably wouldn't bet on it, no, but I. it's probably the second most confident one I'm in out of the five over-unders uh, outside the Miami Heat. But uh, how about up next we wrap that up with our best bet of the episode? 
All right, let's wrap it up here with our best bet for the South East Division. For me, with the Lions, as I said, I think the Miami Heat over 48.5 uh, is a fantastic bet. I do like the Wizards as well. If you are interested in going the Wizards over 34.5, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. So if you want a bit of confirmation there, I'm happy to, to give you that. I won't be betting on it personally. Uh, Lee, have you got anything for us at all? I was I was trying. I just asked you then. Is what's Orlando Magic paying to to lose the uh, to lose? I guess come last, but uh, there's no in the market. That's how confident people are that they're going to come last. So no, I don't have anything for you this week. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough, mate. We're not going to uh, we're not going to give our betting tips uh, as such if we don't think or we're not confident in one. So I'm happy with that. Uh, I will say though. So uh, obviously we, we spoke about the over under lines. I will say the Southeast Division per sports bet, Miami are two bucks, Atlanta two forty, the Wizards twelve bucks, the Hornets fifteen, the Magic out at two hundred and one, obviously. <laughs> uh the Heat at two bucks, I like it. I just think they're that's probably should be more like a dollar sixty to me. That they just wow. seem like a sure unless there's any kind of major injury issues, which they had last season. I just think they're, compared to Atlanta, just their experience across the course of a regular season, their depth. I think, I, I mean, Atlanta have great depth as well, but they're, they're kind of the experience depth, uh, that Miami have, uh, there, I think is probably just going to be too much for Atlanta in terms of winning the division. Uh, and there's some improvement there in Miami with, uh, Tyler Hero, we spoke about, Bam Adebayo, Victor Oladipo, who we probably didn't speak about as much, but uh, anything else to finish before we uh, <laughs> before we call it a day? I don't sound like a very loyal Miami Heat fan, but uh, I'm going to back Atlanta in the regular season, but back my boys come playoffs. Uh, that's probably why I'm not loading up on it, but uh, mate, I think this will be a, a fun uh, division to watch at least. Yeah, I think outside of the Magic, all the other four teams are going to be fairly interesting to watch, so not a necessarily a great division as such, but plenty of interest. That's for sure. Other than that, guys, thank you very much for listening or potentially watching to another episode of the Star and Scrub NBA podcast. Remember to check us out across all our social media channels. Plenty of things coming along and uh, big stuff to announce before the NBA regular season gets underway in just over a month. Can't wait for it.